Thank you for tuning into Stampscaping 101. This is a scene that I've just created with an emphasis uh, as far as the content of this video on spotlighting. Just taking your areas around um, whatever point of emphasis you want uh, to uh, stand out within a, scene, within a scene and keeping those areas a little bit light. This is just a quarter page scene right here, so I just have one little element of light um, kind of you know centralized right here. For that heron, and that uh, certainly focuses our attention to that given area. And uh, I do this on really every scene that I do, you know, in terms of uh, have this, having this oscillation of uh, light and dark right here. But I kept this uh, composition fairly simple with just having kind of the center illumination right here, darkening in the perimeter, and really stamping quite a few objects around to help emphasize um that given space and object within a scene anyways if you choose to watch the video i hope you enjoy it and thanks as always for tuning into the channel okay i thought i would do a quick scene today and talk about this one aspect of uh, scenic stamping that i call spotlighting and that's bringing focus to um, some sort of uh, object or whatever you really want your um, viewer to focus in on um, as far as the focal point or maybe the end and uh, kind of visual path um, point uh, within a scene. So I'm going to use this um, um, Heron and Water stamp. It's a small one. And I thought I would do it in a swampy situation. You can do it in anything you want. These birds can uh, really fit in in any type of uh, uh, setting, yeah, for the most part. I don't know if I'd put it in the Arctic or something like that, but you get the point. All right, I'm, go I'm going to uh, stamp out this large cypress. It's a very large stamp, and um, I'll be doing it on a quarter page card here. It's four and a quarter by five and a half. And let's see, I'll just put this one right here. And uh, when I talk about spotlighting, for the most part, it's about um, creating a vignette, a darker edge around uh, the entire border. When it comes to a quarter page card, that's pretty much what it is. I mean, you can do, uh, you know, three or four points of a uh, kind of illumination by leaving um, certain areas light, but that would be quite a bit for such a, you know, small format like that. So I usually play around with, I don't know, usually two or three areas of light and dark, but if we're talking about um, spotlighting here specifically, I'm just going to go for uh, one in this case. Um, I don't know, maybe two. Maybe I'll have some sort of background light. But um, it'll really be focused in on that bird. Um, and this is what I do a lot um, when it comes to my own kind of private collection of stamps from other companies. Oftentimes, I don't really have too many um, kind of uh, elements from other companies, but a lot of things that I have um, that are my favorite stamps from other companies are subject matter. And uh, when it comes to my utilization of them, it's usually um, where I have focused in on them within kind of a greater scheme where I use all stampscape stamps, or mostly, um, as far as creating an environment for that um, subject matter. My favorite stamps um, are a lot of um, super detailed images from uh, companies that a lot of it is um, uh, let me go for one more of these. Uh, stamps that carried uh, companies that created a lot of stamps from um, engravings. I love those old 19th and 20th century engravings, you know, super highly detailed by kind of expert uh, craftsmen, um, you know, that spent all their spent all their time, you know, doing engravings for book illustrations and uh, publications, things like that. Um, a lot of them were these Dover 
kind of uh, copyright free illustration books that um, a lot of companies um, utilized stamp companies for uh, for you know the majority of their lines and the companies that I liked a lot were the ones that I felt had a you know kind of a really good taste and curated you know offered a curated line of a uh, of those those types of images um, a lot of them aren't around anymore unfortunately so um, I'm glad I got uh, those uh, stamps when I did but I wish I could get more anyway okay so just creating a little bit of depth with a couple different sizes of these uh, cypress uh, trees and let's see sure I left room for my hair and down here. All right, so wherever I place this, I'm just going to create this kind of area of light and make the air around it darker. All right, now, in this type of environment, I'm thinking about a fairly dark environment, you know, where there's a thick canopy of trees. And, uh, I mean, there's all kinds of different looks you can give to um, this sort of a swampy... Uh, terrain here, but um, I think I'm going to go for kind of a more of a, you know, there's this kind of, I don't know, opacity to the, uh, to the, uh, the waters, you know, they're often kind of dark looking, you know, from all the vegetative, you know, types of uh, elements in there that have, you know, sat and decayed over the years, and, uh, you know, the canopy of trees kind of making the, uh, the waters um, a little bit darker than just saying doing a crystalline blue one. So what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll stick with mostly a blue color scheme and then I'll just kind of add some elements of uh, you know some green in there and then I'll darken it all up with the, the use of maybe some grays and blacks but we'll just see how it goes. There's a lot of different approaches uh, to doing this and different looks you can do Okay, so adding it in, I'm really going to focus a lot of the attention around that bird, though. So for the most part, it'll be fairly dark, okay? You can create all kinds of different um, settings, too, in terms of uh, weather, times of day. I could have this you know, very much kind of a foggy, misty morning where there's, you know, just very little, um, uh, very little change in um, value. But this one I'm just going to make dark just for the sake of um, kind of really um, pushing this idea of spotlighting, okay? So now I'm just kind of darkening in just about everything except for that small space down there, okay? Yes, I am going over these trees. I could add some browns or something, you know, some warm tones to those trees. But I don't know if I'm going to. I might add it a little bit later. I'm not sure. I'm just going... By the way, this is summer sky. It's a light blue. If I'm not mistaken, I think it's the lightest blue. Uh, memento blue. But I could be mistaken. I haven't purchased uh, any new pads in a while. I need to. There's some certain colors that I really like um, from other uh, companies, including Memento. Mementos are a really good ink in terms of um, doing this type of application. By the way, this is glossy cardstock, if I didn't say that. Quarter page glossy. I've been playing around with those cosmetic sponges too. I'm using a um, stylus tool here, but those cosmetic uh, sponges work very nicely. Uh, they give you a little bit of a different um, look, or quite a bit different, in terms of uh, the application kind of result. Okay, but adding this down, leaving this area light in here. I might add a little bit of color though, but um, 
I'm going to retain some, you know, a lot of my lights down here. Okay, so you can kind of see it right now. Even with one color, you can see where this is spotlight. Now, when I say spotlight, I, you don't have to have this round shape there. Okay, it just means some sort of um, kind of uh, designated illumination. Instead of using um, a light, we're using the use of uh, we're utilizing shadow to create that um, um, that illusion of light. Okay, it's not really light; it's just reflected. You know, or it's just white there, okay? The white of the paper that we're retaining, so that is that, okay? Let's move up to another color. We're just working through kind of a light to dark um, type of application here. Roughly add this in the same areas that you just used your previous color. I like to work through a nice range of tones, you know, where I'm not jumping from one um, value of a given hue to a vastly darker version of it if I don't have to. That being said, you don't have to have, there's not a certain number of values that you have to work through, but it's just nice to have a range. So, in this case, it's kind of going from a kind of light, medium, dark, although that one's not too dark, but um, it's darker. But you can see there, you know, where there's clearly, you know, a range right there. And most companies, I mean, you know, just within their line of inks, um, there's usually some sort of range. There's usually a light version of uh, a given hue and a darker one. Sometimes it's a mid, mid-tone, you know, sometimes it's a darker one, but there's usually a light one. Not all the time, but... In most cases, you'll find something like that. You don't have to stick with, um, you know, um, a certain brand either. You know, you don't have to go with a light, medium, and dark of the same exact brand. These are dye-based inks, you know, so I would stick with the same type. You know, I wouldn't say go with a light, you know, blue oxide ink or something like that, and then you know switch to a uh, medium, you know, dye-based ink. So it's, in terms of this layering process, like I am adding it down, you want to, uh, you know, stick with the dye bases here. But the spotlighting effect um, is not exclusive to a certain type of ink. You can certainly do this with alcohol markers or something like that, you know, and create this kind of spotlighting look, you know, using those types of. Um, inks you can do use um uh i don't know colored pencils anything you know any type of media that you're doing chalks pastels you know you can kind of create this lighting effect anyways you can kind of see where that light is in there now right and that's just simply by retaining um lighter um versions of uh, that white piece of paper that you're working on, okay? And I say lighter versions because some, you know, in some areas we're adding some uh, light blues in here, you know, but you can kind of surround that light blue with a darker blue and that, you know, you'll have a lighter version of a blue in there, so even the lighter blue is certainly, you know, um, illuminated, you know, in terms of the illusion of illumination just by simply adding a darker color around it. So you're just working with contrast, you know, and artwork like this, you know, we're not working with, um, you know, like LED lights or something like that in back of our scenes. Um, you're just working with white usually and you're defining your light through the use of shadows so it's important to retain some of those areas like that it doesn't mean you have to have you know white there i could go over it with light blue but just you know retain a lot of that light blue by not going over it with the medium and darker blue though and it changes the spirit of it you know Depends on how uh, much contrast you want. Okay, now that is the Danube blue, and that's as dark as that blue gets. I do have some other blues, like a Marvy blue, um, a Marvy Prussian blue. Those ones are darker versions. So this is where you can kind of, um, you know, like I said, you can break out from one 
um, brand and move into the next, okay? Sometimes, you know, certain brands, certain lines within brands do not have the color you're looking for. In this case, I want it to go darker, so I'm dipping into my Marvies right here. So mix and match, you know. If you have 20 different blue pads, you know, from, you know, six different manufacturers, I don't think you're going to need that many. I mean, you could certainly do that to, uh, you know, test things out just to see how far you can push things, but it, a lot of it would probably be, you know, somewhat redundant, you know, so. Um, but always test it out, you know. If you have them, you know, and you have a few, then, you know, play around with it and test it out and see if, um, you know, that other color is influencing um, the overall look and, uh, you know, changing it for the better. This is a Prussian blue. This is one of the darkest blues of, uh, that I've found out there in the, uh, you know, the stamping world, the ink world. So I really like it in terms of pushing my um, range of values within that given um, hue and you know, when you're doing a lot of scenic stamping, blue is, you know, a pretty important player in terms of the, uh, the color schemes. But like I said, this spotlighting kind of idea is not, uh, you know, exclusive to dye-based inks or inks in general. You can do it um, with any media you're working with. You can, you know, apply this concept here. Okay, I want this fairly dark. I want, you know, just for the sake of, you know, um, spotlighting, I really want to create kind of a stage for my star of the scene, that heron. So let's make it pretty dark here, okay? Now your spotlighting doesn't have to be real dark either. It could be just, you know, you can go with the, you know, that first color that I used. Um, you know, in terms of the range of values, it could be as light as that, and that would be fine. Okay, using a lot of this Prussian blue here, kind of closing off the top a little bit, or a lot. Just to really emphasize this um, spotlit creature here. You can do spotlighting with anything too, you know, whenever you're doing kind of a you know, a vignette around something. It could be a word stamp or something like that when you want to give a lot of emphasis to whatever um, it is within a given space. Okay, let's see. Let's move to... Let me switch um, tips here. I have a little bit of brown on this for my, I don't know, whatever I colored in. With that, let's go with the Memento Brown Rich Cocoa. Let's try this one. Let's put that on some of these trees. I'm not looking for to create these brown trees or something like that. I just want to, you know, add some different color on them just to twist the color scheme a little bit. It's not going to look brown because dye-based inks are transparent and the colors underneath are going to show through. So I think this will give it a nice tinge of a, I don't know, a different hue in there. And I don't mind this brown um, kind of overall in the scene, too. Like I said, I want it kind of murkier looking. Okay, I can add some of it down in my shadows as well. It's kind of pulling the trees out a little bit, too. You know, making them a little bit darker than the surrounding area. They are darker to begin with because of the uh, the shading that are that's on the designs. But this is just adding that extra shading to it. See, it's kind of looking a little bit murkier in here. I think I like the idea of some uh, green on those trees as well. Let's add some of this down to the shadow of that tree. Could blend some of it over like so. 
add some of it to the environment as well. Kind of the atmosphere. All right, rich cocoa. Let's try the Marvy brown. This is a dark brown. It's the number 18 Marvy. It's a little bit darker. Let me try to do something here too. See, I'm kind of adding this to the uh, the left side of the tree because the light is coming from the right of it. So maybe making it look a little, little bit more dimensional by creating object lighting here. And I'll add some of it down here in the shadows as well. Tree is creating, you know, casting its shadow, giving uh, the tree some the illusion of opacity, you know, where you don't have uh, uh, the light from behind or throughout it, kind of just shining right through it. See that right there? Okay. Add some more to this tree, but on this tree we'll add some of that shadow on the right side of it because the light is coming from the left. Darkening, darkening the perimeter here. See how it's really kind of bringing the uh, the viewer's attention lower and lower, including my own, by kind of capping off the top here. And like I said, you can have more than one source of you know uh, spotlit area. Um, like for example, um, where would you have more than one? kind of spotlit area. Well, in this case where I don't have like some source of light, but I won't really call that spotlighting. You know, if you had like a sun up there, it represents the source of light, okay? It is kind of, you know, we've emphasized it by, you know, a, a sun or something or a moon by not toning it out, but in an area like this where there isn't, um, kind of a source of light in here. Let's see, uh, there's two areas of um, light. Like a great example would be, like if you had some kind of structure or something like that, you know, like a cabin or something like that. If you don't want to just tone it all out, if you want to kind of bring emphasis to it, you can have that spotlight. And then let's say there's an animal or a person in a canoe or something like that on the lake or a deer in a meadow with that cabin. I would probably have that creature and the structure, you know, somewhat in light. Or I'd create, you know, darker areas around it just to emphasize those two um, objects. Certainly a couple different animals, unless you want to make a point of kind of, you know, camouflage or something like that, or, you know, something hiding and lurking in the shadows, then, you know, you want to have it spotlit, but, um, you know, apart from some sort of um, kind of idea like that, I would um, have those areas um, that they're in uh, illuminated. Okay, so seeing that we have that nice range going from light to dark, and I like to create scenes that um, kind of give the illusion of uh, light coming from within the scene, um, no matter what media I'm working on. Okay, so that's browns right there. I haven't even gone to black and it's looking pretty dark, isn't it? Okay, let's move into that dark. 
for that black. Okay. Yeah, like I said, you don't have to go this dark. I'm just doing it as a kind of a point of emphasis in terms of really bringing the spotlight into a subject matter and kind of bringing our focus um, into that um, object, whatever it might be. In this case, it'll be the bird. At this point in time, my background cypress is really kind of disappearing into the uh, darkness or fog or whatever it might be. Okay. All right. Let me switch. Um, I need a new applicator. Let's add some greens into here. Let's see if it'll kind of give it a, you know, a kind of a different appearance. Um, anytime you add kind of that greenish element into uh, water, it really changes the spirit of it. Just like that down there. That's kind of coming in like that. It, it's no longer this crystalline blue. It's It can add warmth um, to that water. Um, works great for like a tropical type of thing, but um, I don't know, in this case I think it kind of adds to this, I don't know, kind of a living uh, I don't know, type of a living or full of life kind of a ecosystem. Yeah. Kind of on a microscopic level, kind of adding that warmth into there. You know, things kind of grow in the uh, warmer uh, kind of environments, or more things do. Things grow in cold environments too, but there's usually less, uh, certainly less variety. Okay, so anyways, there you go with that. It's really glowing now, isn't it? We've added that um, extra um, hue when you just, uh, things are kind of glowing in terms of light before, but now it's glowing in terms of uh, temperature. And uh, one of these little things with um, adding colors, analogous colors, okay, those are colors next to one another, like on the color wheel. When analogous colors are added next to it, one another, um, I'm kind of blending them right over the top of it here, but um, what they do is they uh, optically they create a color glow, so um, green and blue next to each other, kind of this creating this um, kind of glowing surface like that. Okay, and we can add that down. I mean, you can use, I don't know if I want everything. I kind of like that blue back there. I don't want this all green up there. You certainly could, though, but uh, I'll just leave it as is up there. Just, I don't know, for some variety, too. Okay, so we have that going in right now. Dye based inks of all varieties. I mean, when you blend them and layer them like this, they can really. It really creates a beautiful surface, I think. Um, and this, you can do this on matte paper too. Um, I've done it on other videos, but you know, if you like that real kind of glossy look, that's where the uh, the glossy uh, cardstock comes into play. But you can get a pretty nice glow though working on a, a matte cardstock too. Cardstocks are all um, clay coated, as far as I know. So they really uh, hold the inks really nicely. Um, there's other types of inks you can use, you know, if you want to use like a distress ink or something like that in here, it might kind of add to the overall kind of murkiness and, and warmth too, you know. Okay. 
kind of a nice passage of light in there. I can do this, you know, three different times, and uh, it would probably result in three different looks. You know, I can pro, you know, I mean, I have experience doing this, but um, I can probably get it pretty close um, to this look right here. But what I'm getting at is um, there's a lot of variation that happens. Um, when you do this type of layering, you know, you might use more of one color, you know, and one version of it, and uh, another time you use a little bit more of a different one or whatever, and, and they all come out a little bit different, which to me is something that I really like. I, I never know, really know exactly what something is going to look like, which is not a source of, you know, point of frustration for me. Um, but it's one of those things that I really like about um, kind of rubber stamping in general and uh, the entire process of creating scenes. Uh, I I don't go into something with a really firm concept of um, kind of the end result. I just kind of let it happen and build up. And I like watching it as it occurs, you know, as it happens. Okay, so here's a alcohol pen. Here's a kind of a beige colored one. I can go in and, you know, add some to these trees. There's some areas in here that um, just aren't very conducive for um, uh, the stylus tool or sponging method. So, you know, beauty beautiful thing about kind of alcohol markers is that they come in so many different values and hues so you can just go in and add some shadows or whatever some really kind of finer details um, using these markers and you can go with such a kind of a light hue that it doesn't have to be some you know really um, strong uh, commitment to that hue. You can just go with a lighter value of it. And there's so many different um, versions. Now that was a blue-gray right there. Here's another blue-gray. It's a little bit darker, so I'm kind of doing the same type of thing that I just did with dye based inks. I'm just kind of working through a range of values with that. And you can see there's some shadows down it coming from underneath these um, I suddenly forgot the name of those things that kind of come up like for oxygen um, in the trees. Uh, knees, yeah. These cypress knees coming up. There's some shadows underneath them so I'm just going to uh, at re-emphasizing those um, with some uh, darker values. Okay, so those were a couple of different blue-grays. Uh, here's a darker one. Ooh, that one's really dark. Let me see. I'll add that in. Kind of hitting the shadow areas, re-emphasizing the shadow areas of these images right here. Okay. Now that's a little bit too dark for me, so I'll go with the darker one. And then I'll go with the lighter one to kind of blend that out. Okay? So you can use the lighter versions of uh, you know, any given hue as a blending tool. Okay? You don't always have to use a blender one, just use the lighter version of it. Which might be um, kind of an even better idea for your blending, because you're using the same exact hue instead of just using clear. All right, so you can get things looking a little bit more dimensional that way in a very, you know, much more specific areas. Those ones were Shuttle Art and uh, Marvy La Plume ones. Use whatever brand you want. Okay, so we have our spotlight area in here. Now let's go in. Shall we stamp our bird back in there? Seeing if it'll fit on this. 
little like block. Boy, that comes out hard. I just cleaned these off so they're really super sticky again. Uh, I'm using tack and peel. Tack apostrophe and peel. Uh, the temporary mounting material that you apply to your uh, acrylic blocks for the temporary temporary mounting of your unmounted stamps, bare rubber stamps. Okay, let's see, where should I put this? I think right around in here somewhere. I can put it back in here too. Maybe I'll try to put them right it looks like I can kind of crane that neck right in there, like around like so. Okay. Good. Pick it up a little glare from that. Actually, that's less glare like that. <laughs> All right, so we have our bird back there. We have our shadows down here. That would be the perfect place for these um, pens again to just kind of hit some of those shadows a little bit. Let's wait for that to dry a little bit before I do that, though. Always apply your plastic piece back on your uh, blocks when you're done. All right, actually, I need this again. All right, this is rocks and water. Here I'm going to add some other uh, textures in here, like these rocks. Like, let's imagine these. this area is really shallow here. So we have some rocks. Um, right in here. Something like that. It gives more dimension to it, doesn't it? You know, by having those kinds of textures like that. A lot of times the uh, imagery like this is... Um, I don't know, it's its not really one of those things that um, we think about um, in terms of uh, starting off kind of a st scenic stamping kind of collection of designs, but sometimes the more kind of general types of imagery are the ones that um, can really be utilized almost um, more than any other image because you can use it as filler textures for every scene as opposed to kind of the main subject matter. All right, here's a larger version of that um, rocks and water. And I'll just add this here. Lower down usually means closer to us, okay? So something like that, it kind of pushes that, the um, kind of the depth of field in here. Okay. Now let's add in some additional foliage. Okay, let's see. I have a Spanish moss that I can have kind of coming in. Trying to think here. Do I want a really large one like that? I could. All right, let's do it. Now I'm not going to stamp out this whole thing, so um, I'll probably only use a smaller portion of it, but. I always ink up more than I think I'm going to need. All right, for my foreground here, my really close foreground objects, I'm going to use the VersaVine. It's just so dark and black. Before I do this, I'm taking a look at this and making sure that uh, I'm not going to do any more dye-based ink types of applications up there because you want this VersaVine to be the last thing you do you don't want to go over it with uh, alcohol markers or dye-based things. I, I think it'll smear even after it dries because it's pigment inks sit on the surface of your paper or whatever you stamp it on. 
as opposed to staining the uh, the paper. Okay, let's have this coming in like this. This is really pushing the depth, having something very close to us. And I'm probably utilizing about, I don't know, a second three fifths of it, maybe. Two thirds, or maybe, I don't know, something like that. When people are getting into scenic stamping, um, a lot of times they think that a certain imagery is just, it might be too large for um, a given card. Because they're thinking, okay, you need enough space for this whole thing, and then if you have another stamp right here in its entirety, but you just utilize um, certain portions of a given stamp for the application you, you know, you're looking for. Just cleaning that off. I didn't really clean it off. I stamped off a lot of the ink, but it's still... Okay. All right, but let's make it more um, plush uh, within the scene. Let's add some overhanging leaves, I think. Okay. This. You can stamp this in any direction. It could be getting up and down or whatever. Let's go with the Versifying again. some coming in here. It's really dark on the right and left hand side because of that strong kind of vignette that I created there, but um, that Versafine is really black. See that right there? See that's, It looks like it's in front of that cypress tree right there, doesn't it? I mean it's wet now too, but um, It is a very, very dark ink. Okay, see that? Kind of doing these things on the on the uh, the corners and sides of your piece are, you know, really focus you know, focuses the attention kind of in a directional way too by having these hanging elements. They're kind of, you know, pointing down, taking the viewer's eye, you know, down into the scene, down to what you want the viewer to kind of focus in on. Okay, see them right there. So it's really looking quite layered. A lot of layering. Okay, I think from a... I was going to use these other leaves down here, but from a textural standpoint, let's... Let's keep it just those leaf, leafy types of uh, textures up top. Let me go with um, these reeds down below. And again, just from a textural standpoint um, of creating variation within the, the, the foreground, I think it would be, oh, I don't know, it could create a little bit too much of the same thing, you know, everywhere. So here's this reed stamp like that. Okay. And let's do the same thing on this side. Isn't that Versifying black, beautiful. I didn't used to utilize it. I, I don't know. I started u using it more uh, recently, relatively recently, for my foregrounds. And I thought, oh, okay, that looks really good. Okay. Anyways, can you see that spotlight in there? You know. I've spotlit that area with the use of tones and colors and whatnot. But you can also kind of spot something from a 
kind of an object perspective by the use of um, a lot of foregrounds and darks around the perimeter like that and kind of a making us um, kind of directing our viewer viewer's eye into the scene. Okay, let me see here. I'm looking for some uh, different um, pens here. Here's um, these blues and grays, blue-gray. And what I'm going to do, I'm hoping that, that those sh um, shadows and those ripple ripples are um, dry enough to where I can go over them. And I'll just kind of reiterate that shadow. Here's the shadow of the bird, too. I'm just going to flesh that in a little bit. But just kind of doing, re-emphasizing, you know, reiterating those um, rings there, the ripples there. Uh, I would do the same for those rocks, but I'm not going to, <laughs> because it, it's these ones are kind of amongst the uh, those reeds, and I know that uh, you know that uh, those reeds will blur if I uh, go over it with an alcohol ink, so I won't touch that area. Ooh, that black is really wet. Okay, this is a gray here. So see, even in some fine details, that you know, you can layer um, some different hue down and different values. In this case, I'm doing it with, you know, a very light, light three very light values because this is in the light. I would, you know, chances are it wouldn't be creating some harsh, you know, really harsh, uh, not harsh but hard shadows. Okay, so we have something like that, and uh, you know, if I wanted to, or if I was feeling a little bit more bold, and I had the touch of a, a watercolorist or something like that, which I don't, and I'm not, I really have a lot of respect for people that do watercolors, but you know, we can kind of add some different textures in here. Maybe I'll add a few. I'm doing it, I'm kind of being chicken, and I'm doing it with this, you know, very, very light pen here. Light value of green, but kind of adding these little know, circle type of things or ovals, you know, down here. Maybe we can build it up a little bit more. Here's this blue. Anyway, uh, like I said, like some uh, somebody that was uh, real comfortable with things like watercolors can probably add in some really cool different types of effects like that. But I will fake it, and hopefully it looks like I know what I'm doing, you know, in the end result. But anyway, there's your spotlighting with the use of inks and whatnot. Now let's add in. A little bit of what I really love to do, and that's adding some, um, I always call it special effects, I guess it's kind of, I don't know, after effects, I don't know what you would call it, but um, let's start off with some pigment ink here, so we'll go with some frost white, I still need to be very careful around this uh, Versifying. Maybe I should add to those that versifying after I did this type of things, just so I don't have to kind of work my way around it. But this is just adding in a very light application of pigment ink to create uh, kind of this illusion of a, uh, you know, some fog or mist. All right, I have to be really careful that I don't apply too much of this because um, I can't 
I don't want to dab off any of my pigment ink either. So just add it very slowly and very lightly, okay, at first. Kind of I like to add it where light meets dark, so I'm just kind of starting in my lighter area. If it isn't light in a certain area, then kind of this little fog wouldn't be so illuminated, right? So that's kind of the concept of that. So I'm starting in my lighter area and working into my darker and just tamping very lightly. I want to add some of it down here, but I have these reeds, so I won't do that. My pigment ink reeds, which is what Versafine is. Can you see that mist in there? Let's add a little bit of it in the background. Sometimes things more distant are, you know, there's more kind of moisture in the air between us as the viewer and that object, so um, I might lighten that object up a little bit. Not if it's in the dark, if it, this distant object was over here and it's in complete dark, then we wouldn't see this kind of illumination of a uh, mist, so I wouldn't add so much of that, you know, into that area over here. So we'll kind of just taper it off. I'll have a little bit more next to the light and we'll have a little bit less of it as it transitions into the darkness. It's getting loud. I hope that isn't picking up too much on this uh, video. Someone's they're mowing lawn somewhere. I think across the street or something. Okay, so we have that bird in there. Let me go up the. Let me go up this bird a little bit more and just uh, put in a little bit of fog. How about like something like that? It looks like it's bottom lit, doesn't it? Because we have that kind of mist, or maybe the light is reflecting off the water and reflecting over that, uh, you know, reflecting back onto this bird, the silhouette of that. Okay. And um, let's take um, a gel pen, white gel pen. This one's a Uniball Signo pen. And uh, let's add some little highlights. I'm going on the lighter area of, you know, how I kind of darken in some of my shadows in these ripples. I'll lighten up some of the highlights of that. Yeah, let me take a pause this for a second. Okay. Adding those little highlights like this is really fun. It kind of gives an extra um, texture to the surface of the water. It just says that there's a surface on there. Um, you know, and there's depth to the water as well. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit more. Yeah, you see these little things work great for things like stars if it's in the sky. It gives depth to your um, kind of galaxy or whatever. It works great at the, the base of uh, waterfalls for that splashing water. And for the water's surface, it creates um, specular light. It's, in photography, it's light that's brighter than white. And let me see, let me adjust something right here too. Okay, I've just adjusted my um, exposure. When I start, when my scene starts off with white, I have, you know, a certain set exposure on my camera, but then as I 
kind of darkens in, I need to readjust the exposure, especially if I'm zoomed in like this, otherwise you're not getting a kind of an accurate representation of a kind of the value of the card, you know, in terms of light and dark. So that's, this is a kind of more along the lines of what it looks like at this point in time, value-wise, okay? All right, so let's see. I'm trying to figure out if I want to add any highlights to my um, foreground imagery. I'm not sure if I do. I might want it just as a silhouette. Sometimes I put little highlights on my um, foreground imagery just to be reflecting some of that light, but I think I like it as is just dark, like so. All right, but I think that's about it. Um, yeah, you can use other different colors of, uh, you know, gel pens. Um, the scene is, is done in blues and greens. You can use some, you know, put some blue types of uh, effects in here too. I, I would keep them out of the lighter areas, but uh, so put a few little spots here and there, just, you know, for a little bit of variation uh, t from a textural standpoint. And here it's very, or somewhat subtle. <laughs> I was going to say very subtle. In some of the areas that I'm adding it to, when it's darker it stands out, and when it's lighter it kind of stands out too, but... I kind of try to um, add it. I'm adding it in some areas where it's roughly the same value as the background, so it's just kind of creates a little bit of a different texture. This is one's green. All right, but I think that's about it. All right, so we have our spotlit um, creature. Now, this subject of this video is, is about spotlighting, but I pretty much do it in every scene, I, but I don't just emphasize it in terms of, the, you know, the content of what I'm talking about um, in those videos. I'm sure I talk about it a little bit in terms of, uh, you know, I'm just mentioning, retain some areas that are lighter. It doesn't have to be white, but just kind of uh, create a darker perimeter around the things that um, that you want to emphasize. So in this case, we have kind of a single source or single spotlit um, creature. And, you know, when we look at the overall, you know, I think it does, you know, our focus of attention goes right to that object. It could have been over here, too, in the corner. It doesn't have to be, you know, any, you know, specific area, you know, kind of an area that's really... Um, spotlight down here and the rest of it is dark up here, you know, it could be, you know, rather dramatic in terms of a, a compositional statement, but um, I don't know, on this one right here, it's just pretty easy to put it somewhere towards the center and uh, any type of creature or living thing or object like a structure, you know, it generally gets the viewer's attention, you know, um, but when you spotlight it, you know, it makes it you know, even more so. So on the other side of things, too, let's say you have something that you have in the scene or you have a lot of different elements. If you want to de-emphasize something, too, um, you can darken it. You know, you can cut the contrast down between the object and the background, too. And have it in shadow. Let's say I had, like, some kind of, like, little bayou shack over here or something like that. I, you know, if I didn't want, you know, the viewer's attention to go to that, I can have it in darkness or whatever. You can certainly layer things over the front of it as well, you know. Um, let's say if you're doing some sort of creature, like I said before, and uh, you want to de-emphasize the attention, you know, for the sake of, uh, let's say it's some sort of predator or something like that, if you want it in kind of the bushes and in a little bit of darkness, it would be some kind of this secondary type of thing that you would be, you know, uh, kind of discovering, you know, from a visual standpoint, you can have some sort of prey in the, you know, one end, 
and uh, the predator in another end that's kind of de-emphasized you know I would probably emphasize it slightly but I would probably not have it in such a, a high contrast um, it area high contrasty high contrasted is that a word I don't know you know cut down the contrast between uh, what you want someone to see so it'd be kind of interesting to have a pair of eyes looking at that but that's not this kind of scene right here. This bird's kind of just enjoying its time in peace. Uh, I guess there's no snapping turtles or alligators coming up from underneath its legs that it has to worry about at this point in time. Um, but uh, I don't know. You never know. Okay, so anyways, I hope you enjoyed this scene. It's a pretty easy one in terms of the color scheme right here and uh, the utilization of a uh, kind of minimal um, types of uh, hue changes throughout here. Um, but I think it creates a pretty effective scene as far as the uh, kind of the uh, location of this uh, setting uh, or what it depicts. So uh, thanks as always for tuning into the channel. Drop us a note in the comments section if you have any questions.